It says, I urge you then, first of all, everybody say, first of all. So this is the first thing that you should do as a believer. Whether you voted for them or not, whether you like them or not, this is the first thing that you should do as a believer in Christ. First of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. How many of you know your prayers will make a difference in this nation? Come on. So pray for your leaders. Again, whether you voted for them or not, doesn't matter. Whether you like them or not, doesn't matter. As a believer in Christ, we have a responsibility to pray for our leaders. Can somebody say amen? Number two, Romans chapter 13, verse 1. The Apostle Paul again writing, Romans 13, 1. He said, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that are, exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Everybody say, submit to your leaders. Again, whether you voted for them or not, whether you like them or not, as believers in Christ, we are to submit to the governing authority. Somebody say amen. Now, there's only one exception to that. There is an exception to that rule. If they ask you to do something that is in direct defiance of the commands of God, then you do not have to submit. You submit to God. Amen? But any other reason, we should submit to our leaders and uh, be, uh, don't, don't rebel against our leaders, whether we like them or not, whether we voted for them or not, doesn't matter. The Bible tells us we should pray for them and we should submit to them. Thirdly, just on a practical basis, we should support those who are in authority. We should support their programs, their plans. It won't, you know, again, unless, it, unless their programs or plans are direct violation of the law of God, we should support the plans and programs of our governing authority. Somebody say amen. It's not going to help us and it's not going to help the nation to fight against those that are in power. They're trying to do their best. They're trying to do what they believe is good for the nation. So you and I should support our newly elected officials. Can you say amen? All right, give the Lord a clap for that. Amen. Again, at, here at VCA, uh, we don't, uh, uh, we don't uh, endorse any political candidate. We didn't endorse any political candidate during the campaign. Uh, we tell all of our leaders that they are st strictly forbidden to use any church activities for any uh, political uh, means. Uh, however, as believers in Christ, we believe that we do have a responsibility on an individual basis as citizens of the Philippines, as followers of Christ, to be involved in the political process. So I hope that you voted. I hope that you prayed for your leaders. And uh, whether, they, whether the ones that you voted for were elected or not, tell your neighbor, support them anyway. <laughs> Amen. All right. All right, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer and uh, prepare ourselves for the message this afternoon. Father, we thank you for your word. God, your word will go forth. It will not return to your void. It will accomplish the thing that you desire for it to accomplish. Your word is like a sword, a double-edged sword that pierces our heart and our spirit, God. Let your word get down on the inside of us. Lord, I pray that you would enlighten us, that you would uh, enlighten us, that you would awaken us, oh God, by the power of your word. Your word is light unto our path. Your word is a light unto our soul. Let your word bring light and life to each and every one of us here this afternoon. Father, we thank you for the power of the word of God, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we believe, God, that we're going to hear from heaven through your word this afternoon. Lord, give us eyes to see, hearts to hear, hearts that understand, God. Lord, we pray and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a clap. Amen. Well, the title of my message is a little bit unusual this afternoon. X-Men Apocalypse. <laughs> Anybody see the movie? How many of you have seen the movie, X-Men? All right, a handful of you. How many of you are embarrassed to say that you saw the movie? You shouldn't be embarrassed. It's just a movie, right? Uh, your pastor happens to be a big sci-fi fan. If it's, uh, if it's a science fiction movie, I'm probably going to see it. So I love Star Wars, Star Trek, anything that's science fiction. Uh, I'm just, I just really enjoy science fiction. Now, uh, I did enjoy the movie. I thought the movie was pretty good. But there were two things in the movie 
that, that really bothered me. And I want to share that to you, first of all, and then see how it pertains to us today. I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't watch the movie. I, don't think, I, don't, I think it's an okay. I'm just saying you need, to, you need to tell your neighbor, guard your heart. You know, whatever you watch on television or, or, or movie, you, you need to be aware. You need to guard your heart. There's two things that bother me about the movie. Again, I think it was, it was actually a pretty good movie. But uh, two things that bother me. Number one thing that bothered me about the movie was that, well, for those of you that hadn't seen the movie, let me give a little bit of a, 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 an idea, just basically what the movie's about. So there's this ancient being. Uh, he kind of uh, comes to life again from the dead, and then he, uh, uh, he gathers four, uh, you know, X-Men is about mutants, right? So he gathers four mutants and empowers them, and they're like the four, and it's even mentioned in the, in the movie, they're like the four horsemen that are in the book of Revelations, and then he's going to destroy the whole uh, earth and bring the apocalypse. And then, of course, the X-Men have to rise up and fight, fight this being. Uh, the first thing that bothered me about this, uh, this being had the audacity to call himself God. That really bothered me. That, that this, you know, even though it's just, I know it's a science fiction movie, I know it's fantasy, but, but that this being would have uh, the, the audacity to say that he was God. I mean, he even mentioned the Hebrew name for God uh, and called himself that, you know. And, and I just thought, my goodness, th this is really, this is too much. The second thing that bothered me that was not quite as, uh, not really, uh, you wouldn't really notice it unless you really discern in your heart. It, it was something very subtle. And here's something we have to learn about anything that we watch. Listen, if it's coming out of Hollywood, if it's coming out, even, even, even here in the Philippines, it's, if it's coming from an ungodly source, many, many times, oftentimes, there is a subtle ungodly message that is permeating the things that we are watching and listening to. Hello, are you here with me this afternoon? So you've got to be aware. So there was this subtle, uh, you may not even picked up on it whether you saw the movie or not, but there was this subtle idea that any God who would destroy the whole earth must be evil. Well, I'm here to tell you this afternoon, number one, the only true and living God, Jesus, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, the only true and living God is a good God. Everybody say amen. There is nothing evil in him whatsoever, not the slightest bit of evil in the creator of the universe. He is a God of love. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of forgiveness. But this same God who created the heavens and the earth, the Bible says very clearly there will come a day when he will indeed destroy this earth. And it's not because he is evil. Are you here this afternoon? All right. I want you to open your Bibles with me to the book of uh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse 10. While you're looking for that, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, something interesting happened in the movie. Um, I don't know that this has ever happened before. You know, I, I came out of the theater and was walking, walking around. There was lots of people milling around. And uh, there was just this sudden, and I wasn't thinking about it at all. You know, I was, kind of, I was thinking about the movie. But there was this sudden revelation that there's a multitude of people who are walking through the malls, you know, some are texting, some are talking, some are looking at different stuff, who are absolutely oblivious to the fact that there is judgment that is about to come upon the earth, absolutely oblivious to the fact that there is a heaven, that there is a hell, absolutely oblivious to the fact that if you have not accepted Christ in your heart, you will be separated from God forever in the lake of... Totally oblivious, not a clue. And so I, saw, I was out, you know, I was just... I wasn't thinking about that at all. Again, I was thinking about the movie I'd just seen, and I walked out, and I see all these people, and there's just this sudden... It's like my eyes were open, and it was just like, oh, my goodness. These people are going to hell, and they don't have a clue. They really have no idea what's about to come upon the earth. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Jump down to verse 12. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. Interesting thing here, the Bible says in verse 12, speaking to believers, as you look forward to the day of God. Now, if I were to ask for a show of hands this afternoon, how many of you are looking forward to the day that God pours out his wrath and his judgment on the earth? I don't think there'd be too many hands raised. Hello. Hello, are you here this afternoon? Yet, the Bible tells us, as believers in Christ, we should be looking forward to his coming. We should be looking forward. The Bible does say very clearly that there is a day coming when God will destroy the earth and create a new heaven and a new earth, that Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back soon. Hello? If you are a believer in Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, you should know that heaven is your home, your citizenship is in the kingdom of God, that, you are, that your heart is set on eternity and not on the things of this world. Somebody say Amen. Tell your neighbor, remember Lot's wife. You remember Lot's wife? You know the story of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. God, God tells them to flee from the destruction and don't look back. But Lot's wife, her heart was fixed on the things of this world. She couldn't imagine leaving behind her material possessions, her prestige. She couldn't imagine leaving. The, her heart was so on the things of this world that she turned around. The Bible says she became a pillar of salt. So as believers in Christ, we are but passing through this earth. You don't belong here. Your home is in heaven. Hello. Come on, give the Lord a clap for that. You don't belong here. This is not your home. Your home is in heaven. We are just passing through for a short period of time. And so the Bible says that we should be actually looking forward to this coming of Christ. As you look forward to the day of God, speeding its coming. Did you know that you can speed up the coming of Christ? The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 24, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole earth and then the end shall come. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole earth, and then the end shall come. The way to speed up the coming of Christ is we should be sharing this gospel all over the planet. There is going to come a day. You know, I thank God that, uh, really, I thank God that he called me to the Philippines because Filipinos are some of the most natural evangelists on the whole planet. Give yourselves a clap for that. It's really true. <laughs> Filipinos share the gospel just... If a Filipino gets born again, he's going to tell his friends and his family. Many Westerners don't do that. But there's going to come a day when that last person, whoever that person is, in whatever tribe or nation, there's going to come a day when that last person who is going to be saved gets saved. And I pray that it's a Filipino who leads them to Christ. Puts a gospel track in their hand or leads him in a sinner, sinner's prayer, and then suddenly Jesus will come and take us home. It'll be a glorious day, amen? amen? We can speed the coming of Christ by taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. The Bible goes on to say, as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. It's a day that we should be looking forward to if our hearts are not set on this world, but our hearts are set on eternity. Is your heart set on eternity this afternoon? Don't make heaven, don't make, don't make this world your home. Heaven is your home. Amen? Do not store up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust can 
can destroy. But store up for yourself treasure in heaven because that's where you're going to spend eternity. Amen? I want us to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Again, the Apostle Paul writing here in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. He says, and we'll get, this is where we're going to spend most of our time in this passage. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. I want to say that again. We're going to focus in on that, on that phrase in just a moment. The secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed. That's, talking, that's speaking about the Antichrist. The lawless one will be revealed when the Lord Jesus will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. I want you to notice that, that phrase, that serve the lie. Verse 10, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth. Hmm? Let me read that again. It says, wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion. They're deceived. They're deluded. They're, they're, they're not thinking. A delusion, a delusion is you're not thinking right. If you are deluded, you're not thinking right. You're not seeing reality the way it is. You, you have a distorted view. There's a powerful delusion so they will believe Note the, note the phrase, they believe the lie. And so, that, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now this passage is obviously talking about the last times, the end days before the coming of Christ. The Bible teaches us that wickedness will increase in the earth before Jesus comes. How many of you realize, realize and you need to wake up, how, how many of you realize wickedness is increasing in the earth? It is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Things that even 10 years ago would have been unheard of, things that even 10 or 15 years ago would have been, people would have been shocked, people would have been, people would have been, they would have rejected these things. Now it's commonplace. Are you following me? People living together without being married. And they say, oh, it's just a piece of paper. People exchanging partners, going from one partner to another partner. Some of them men with men, some women with women. All kind of things, all kind of filth on our television, in the movies, in the theaters, on our, on our music. Young people, young people, hear me. I've got nothing against rap music. I, I think God is a creative God, so I'm not against the genre. But there is some rap music that is absolutely filthy, pornographic. I don't know how you could listen to it and be a Christian. Sometimes I go into a clothing store and, and I hear this music playing and I'm thinking... My gosh, do, do, do they even realize what's being said? It's X-rated. It's pornographic. The filth that is flooding this earth, it's, it's like a stream of filthy water that's flooding the earth. And if you are a believer in Christ, we have got to stand and live a life of holiness and righteousness. Somebody say amen. amen. There's a flood of filth where evil is becoming normal where immorality is becoming normal. 
And, and people will look at you and think that you are, there's some, people will think that there's something wrong with you. See, that's the delusion, right? That's a deception. To be deceived means that you believe something to be true, which is actually false, right? So if, if somebody, they're a, uh, they're a con artist, some of you this has happened, this has happened to me. Somebody comes to you and they're a con artist, they, they swindle you out of your money, it's because you believe them. You believe something to be true that was actually false. Are you following me? That's what it means to be deceived. Now, the Bible says wickedness is increased. As wickedness increases, a deception will come upon the earth where people actually believe what is wrong is right, what is right is wrong. Moms become dads and dads become moms. And the whole world is just going crazy. Are you following me? So there is an evil flood that is coming upon the planet. It's called the secret power of lawlessness. It's already at work. This is rampant. But let me tell you, the Philippines is not exempted. This is rampant in the West. Lawlessness is this. Lawlessness is, lawlessness is you don't have the right to tell me what is wrong or right. That's lawlessness. You have no right to tell me what's wrong or right. That's your belief. I have a different belief. Lawlessness is there's no right or wrong. Everyone determines their own right and their own wrong. That spirit has already flooded the planet. Are you following me? There is a right, there is a wrong, there is a God, there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is something called sin, there is something called righteousness, and you better know the difference. Lawlessness. You can't tell me what's right or wrong. That's just some old book that you believe. Written hundreds of years ago. That's what they'll tell you. The secret power of lawlessness is already at work. The Bible says, interesting passage, this passage, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 to 12, because we see these words repeated several times, lawless, lawlessness, wickedness is repeated twice, then the word deceives and delusion are repeated once each, and then the phrase, the lie, the lie is repeated twice, it's the phrase, the lie, now I can only speculate what the lie is, but I don't think we have to look very far from the passage to know what the lie is because the Bible says that it's wickedness that deceives. So the lie, for me, the lie is people don't believe that what they are doing is wrong. By living in before getting married. By lying. Oh, it's, all, it's just a little lie, you know. It's just a little white lie. No big deal. The lie is that people don't believe what they're doing is actually wrong. They actually believe it's okay. Oh, if he wants to have, you know, if, if a man wants to have sex with another man, that's, that's his business. If a woman wants to have sex with another one, that's her business. The lie is believing that what they're doing is not wrong. But it is wrong. And it's a lie. The lie is believing that, that we are a God unto ourselves, that we can make our own rules and regulations, we can make, or we can make up our own religion, our own beliefs. It's a lie. It's a deception. It's a delusion. And it's flooding the earth. It's all over the place, including the Philippines. It's all over your television on Vice Ganda. That's filthy stuff. You shouldn't be watching that. You shouldn't be watching that. It's making jokes of things that are evil. Pretending that it's okay. It's just okay. It's not okay. It's sin. It will take your soul to hell. All right. The Bible says... 
in 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, Peter writes this, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. So this is happening already as well. Our young people are already faced with this. Maybe the older people, not so much. But the young people are faced with this nearly every day. Where their classmates, if they, tell, if they tell somebody about the Bible, or they tell somebody about being born again, or they tell somebody something's right or something's wrong, then their classmates will laugh at them. They will scoff them. They will mock them. They will say, that's old stuff, you know, that's some old tradition. What's wrong with you? That spirit is already spreading. And it won't be long that adults will, are doing the same. It's the West. It's already flooded the West. You go any Western country, Canada, United States, Australia, wherever, you go any Western country, and if you stand for righteousness, people will look at you like there is something wrong with you. They'll mock you and scoff you and, and, and say that, you know, you're a bigot, you're, 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 you're judgmental or whatever. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. That's really the reason. Because they just want to follow their own evil desires. So they're going to try to mock you and make you look like you're the one that's something wrong with you. They, they will say, where is this coming? Speaking of the coming of Christ. They will say, where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Verse 11, jump down to verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Since we know that Jesus is coming soon, the earth will be burned up with fire. If you know that to be true, if you believe the Bible is the word of God, if you know that to be true, what kind of people ought you to be? What kind of life should we live? Peter tells us, he says that you ought to live holy and godly lives. Verse 13, in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Do not allow the flood of filth that is poured out on this earth. I tell you what, it's one click away on your computer. And some of you are struggling with that. One click away, absolute filth. You know, when I, when I was a kid, when I, when I was a, a, a young man, pornography was something that was difficult to get a hold of. You had to find it in somebody's house or you had to, you know, you had to go. But now, it's everywhere. It's flooding the earth. And many of you are young people. Your minds and your hearts are being filled with garbage from, from the pit of hell. The Bible tells us that we've got to live lives that are spotless, that are blameless, and that are at peace with Him. Do not allow yourself do not allow your eyes to view things filthy things do not allow your ears to listen to stuff that is just garbage keep your heart clean keep your mind clean keep your eyes and ears and and your body clean by the grace of God and by the blood of the lamb and then it says that we should be at peace with him in other words if you if you fall if you sin well, confess your sin, repent from it, and get your heart right so that you can be at peace with God. Amen? Don't continue to live in that lifestyle. Listen, if you struggle, we'll help you. There's no condemnation to anyone that's in Christ Jesus. If you are struggling with pornography, we'll help you. If you're struggling with your sexuality, we'll help you. I tell you what, you should, you should enroll in Journey to Freedom this coming June 13th. We have a whole team right now, a whole team of our top leaders who are going through 25 weeks of training of how to help people get free from homosexuality. Why? Because we don't believe in just 
throwing people away because they've sinned. We believe in redemption. We believe in reconciliation. We believe in the forgiveness and the mercy of God. We believe that you can be free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You don't have to live in bondage. You don't have to live in bondage. You can be free. There is freedom in Christ. There is freedom in Jesus. The Bible says that we are to live spotless, blameless lives that are at peace with God. Verse 17, therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, tell your neighbor, you've been warned. Come on, tell your neighbor, you've been warned. You've been warned that there's a flood of filth coming upon the earth. You're being warned right now. Do not be swept with the flood. For the believer, for the Christian, we are, it's, like, it's like a river that has a strong current. The believer, the Christian, you are swimming against the current. Right? This whole world is getting worse and worse. If you're a genuine believer, don't get taken by the world and say, oh, it's okay, it's all right. It's just normal. It's not normal. It's sin. So the Bible tells us you've been forewarned. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard. Guard your heart. Guard your mind. Guard what you view with your eyes. Guard what you allow to come in your ears. Amen? Guard. Take care. Be careful. Be on guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless. Listen to that. Guard so that you may not be carried away. It's like like a river. It's flowing. The river of wickedness, the river of lawlessness that, that that, that is saying sin is all right. You don't have to get married. You don't have to have a certificate. If you love one another, it's just a piece of paper. That's the sin of the world, that it's flooding. You can lie every once in a while. You know, it's just a little lie. It's no big deal. It's it's the flood of sin. All this this garbage is coming. You're going to be carried. If you're not careful, you end up believing what the world believes because all of your friends, all of your relatives, and the people will start looking at you and saying, there's something wrong with you because you stand for righteousness. You stand for holiness. You stand for the truth. The truth is, there is a God. He is holy, and sin is sin, and he wants us to live righteous and holy lives. Somebody say amen. Amen. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. The apostle Paul, again writing here. Romans 13, 11. Do this. Understanding the present time. The hour already come, the the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. This whole world is living for pleasure. How to gratify the desires of the flesh. I want to read one last passage of Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Again, the Apostle Paul writing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. No one knows the day. No one knows the hour. Verse 2, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness. Listen, listen. You are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. So the Bible is saying 
Jesus will come like a thief for the unbeliever. For, for like it happened in the days of Noah, men were given in marriage, they were, they were drinking, and no, they were oblivious. This is what the feeling I had coming out of that. Thing. People were oblivious to the judgment that is coming upon the earth. People are totally oblivious to the fact that Jesus is returning. They have a, don't have a clue. But the Bible says, as believers in Christ, though we do not know the day or that we do not know the hour, we do know the season. And the signs are everywhere. And the signs are increasing. Even as I speak, the signs are everywhere that the coming of the Lord is soon. Somebody say amen. There's about 10 people that are excited about Jesus coming. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm ready. I want to go, man. This world has nothing for me. This world has nothing to offer. Compared to the glories of heaven, compared to, compared to the bliss of spending eternity with Christ, my goodness. This world has nothing to offer. Tell your neighbor, remember Lot's wife. Uh-huh. Her heart was fixed on the things of this world. She couldn't give him up. She became a pillar of salt. You are all children of the night, children of the light, and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. Tell you what, there's some Christians who are asleep. Nudge your neighbor, tell them to wake up. Nudge your neighbor, wake up. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. They're oblivious to what's happening. Let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Faith, hope, and love. These three things remain. The greatest of these is love. God is a God of love. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of forgiveness. But there will come a day when enough is enough. Where the world has become so evil, and I'm telling you, it's happening. It happened in the days of Noah. It happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. It happened many years ago in New Orleans, Katrina. I don't know, some of you are maybe too young to remember that. But what what a lot of you don't know is is, uh, that flood came right at the time when there was a massive homosexual festival going to be put on. There comes a time, God is, listen, God is merciful. He is forgiving. He is patient. The Bible says this. He is patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But there comes a time when the cup is full and enough is enough and God was going to say, it's over. It's enough. I'm going to take my people out of this place and destroy the earth. And it's not because God is evil. There is no evil in God. Not even a little bit. It's because he is love. And he wants us to live lives that are righteous and holy. That exemplify the character of Christ. And so I want to encourage you here this afternoon. Keep your heart clean. Be awake. Be sober. Don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. This world will deceive you, telling you that what's wrong is all right. It's not all right. Let's stand together. We're going to pray.